Welcome everyone. My name is Mike Lamoy and I am with the Division of Nature Preserves with the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. I'm a botanist and plant ecologist and you wonder perhaps why I'm here to talk about a bird. Well, I'm a birder too, so uh, I have a real passion for birds. Uh, we're here to commemorate a bird that is no longer with us and it hasn't been for a long time. Uh, it's a bird that is like no other. And just to be clear, for those of you who aren't birders, we're not talking about the pigeons that you see on the barns and in towns, the, the rock pigeon it's called, or in some cases they were called carrier pigeons or messenger pigeons if they were utilized for such purposes. So this is a bird that is extinct and has been since 1914. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to tell you uh, and read to you a quote that's by John James Audubon, just to give you an idea of the enormity of the number of birds that existed in passenger pigeon populations in eastern North America. There were, by some accounts, billions of these birds perhaps the most common bird ever in eastern North America. And John James Audubon, you know, the famous artist and ornithologist and uh, naturalist, lived in Henderson, Kentucky for about 10 years, just across the Ohio River from Evansville, Indiana. He also lived in Louisville for a while. On a trek he was making from Henderson, Kentucky, on the banks of the Ohio to Louisville, he observed one of these giant flocks of passenger pigeons. And here's what he said. The air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. I cannot describe to you the extreme beauty of their aerial evolutions. Like a torrent and with a noise like thunder, wheeling and twisting within their continued lines resembling coils of a giant serpent. And he goes on to state that it was like this and in undiminished numbers for over a period of three days. And there are all sorts of accounts of these huge populations of passenger pigeons that occurred in eastern North America. What we're here today, of course, is to dedicate a marker to the passenger pigeon. And uh, it came to fruition in part by a walk I was taking along a sidewalk in downtown Indianapolis in front of the Indiana Historical Bureau. And little did I know after stopping there that they were responsible for the marker program. You've seen all these historical markers all over the state for a variety of reasons. And I learned that they were the ones that were responsible for that. Well, to make a long story short, I was asking questions about them. How do you get one established and so forth? I was told, well, submit an application. And that's what I did, and it was, it was submitted. It was reviewed and accepted. And, well, the rest is history, shall we say. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about the, uh, before we start talking more about the passenger pigeon, telling you about the marker program, and I'd like to introduce Casey Pfeiffer, who is the, uh, the person in charge of that program in the His Indiana Historical Bureau. Casey. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, as Mike said, uh, I'm with the Indiana Historical Bureau, and we do oversee the state marker program. And I'm honored to be here today as we dedicate this new marker that commemorates the passenger pigeon and really examines some of the reasons for which the species went extinct in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, today, if you travel the state, you can actually find state markers standing in 88 of our 92 counties. And it's our hope that within the next few years, hopefully, we'll be able to say that's 92 of 92. Um, actually, here in Franklin County, this is our 13th. So you guys are doing a great job here commemorating your history, um, which is always so great to see. One of the things I love most about the marker program, and Mike kind of touched on it, is the variety of topics that we commemorate. So we have markers to women's history, African American history, sports, science, medicine, technology, 
and now this new one uh, for the passenger pigeon. And Mike asked me a couple of weeks ago if this was our first marker to a natural feature. And I had to kind of pick my brain a little bit and look through the marker collection. And we have a couple markers to state parks and state forests, um, to limestone quarries across the state, and um, you know even that marks the Buffalo Trace. But really looking at a whole species, this is the first that we've done. Um, and it's something that really drew us to this topic when we received the application. Um, the other thing that we really look for is um, source material to support uh, the application. And uh, Mike and everyone who helped with this did a fantastic job. Uh, this marker is now one of over 600 markers that we've installed going all the way back to the 1940s. Um, and the thing is, it wouldn't be possible without dedicated people across the state who are committed to preserving the state's history. So again, I can't thank you all enough uh, for taking an interest to be here today. Um, first, I want to thank, of course, Mike, thank you for submitting the application, for taking an interest in the market program, following up, and for all the correspondence, for helping to plan this wonderful dedication today. Um, it's great to see so many people out here. Um, to Joel uh, Greenberg, whose research was invaluable as we did this project, uh, learned so much. <laughs> and uh, like I said, that's the greatest thing about this job, is just getting to learn the variety of history that not only touches the state, but touches us on a national level, too. Um, so that has been incredible. Um, to everyone in Indiana Audubon, you're going to hear a little bit um, more in a second, but thank you guys and Indiana DNR um, for their support funding the marker and just their support of the project. Um, and I also thank everyone with the um, historic site. Um, I don't know if Jay Dishman is here. Um, Jay, thank you. And everyone else here who kind of helped coordinate um, getting the marker in the ground and everything, we're very appreciative. And to all of you guys here for making the effort to come out today, one o'clock on a Monday, that's great to see so many people. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more about the Pasture Pigeon, I would definitely encourage you to <laughs> look at Joel's work. But at the same time, um, we have, um, for all of our markers, um, annotated footnotes and um, points for every single statement that goes on a marker. So that's available on our website at in.gov slash history. Um, you can search any marker really that we have across the state um, by category or um, by county. And uh, there's a wealth of additional information there. Um, I want to recognize too uh, Annette Sherber, who's our intern at the Bureau this year. She's a second year uh, fellow in the IUPUI Public History Program and did a tremendous amount of research on this marker. Um, and she's written a uh, blog post on the topic as well that um, we have and you guys can search as well. But thank you so much for being here today. And Mike, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. specimen wild passenger pigeon in the world. So I think that's a pretty significant event. Uh, it was taken about five miles from here, don't know exactly where, but somewhere up near Laurel. And it was verified by a person by the name of Amos Butler, who was born and reared in Brookville, Indiana, not far from here. He's a magnificent ornithologist, really is sort of our pioneer ornithologist in Indiana. And uh, he was a very active person. In fact, he uh, was fundamental in organizing the Indiana Academy of Science in the late 1800s, which is still in existence, as well as the Indiana Audubon Society. The Indiana Audubon Society spearheaded the funding of this marker. And I think it's uh, our pleasure to have the president, current president of the Indiana Audubon Society here with us to tell us about that uh, funding. And, uh, if I could welcome, if you would welcome Jeff Cannon, the president of the Academy of Indiana Audubon Society. Thank you. Thanks, this is a great crowd. Thanks everybody for coming. A um, little bit more about the significance. As Mike said to Amos Butler, there is another Audubon Society in Indianapolis named after Amos Butler, but he was also president of the Indiana Audubon Society. So 
there's some significance there that kind of ties in, but Indiana Audubon Society also owns some property about 20 minutes north of here, for those of you that might or might not know. It's called Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary, but um, I really just want to thank several people here today. Um, four of them being Mike Kamoya, Don Gorney, Damon Lowe, and Joel Greenberg. Those four guys were the, the folks that spearheaded this and got this project started, and Mike did a lot of work on this with Casey um, to get it done from start to finish. Uh, I also want to thank Casey Pfeiffer with the uh, Historical Bureau and the Indiana Historical Bureau for allowing this and the uh, Canal, Whitewater uh, Canal State Historic Site as well. Um, I want to thank the Indiana Audubon Society Board of Directors for approving the funding. You know, we did, we had a, our, our immediate past president, Brad Bumgardner, started a GoFundMe account. We raised a little bit more than half of the funding that way, and then the Indiana Audubon uh, put in the rest of the funding. So um, with that, I think that's, that's it for me. Um, uh, the, it, this, this project, you're going to hear from Joel here in a few minutes about it, uh, um, but he, he wrote a book, which I'm sure he's going to tell you about, but that was a lot of uh, what kind of helped spearhead this project as well, and I know a lot of the information that Casey Garner came from that book and Joel's research, so uh, I thank you guys for coming, and uh, this is obviously a very special thing, and Indiana Audubon Society is very proud to be a part of it, so thanks for having me. About 40 miles from here, a certain passenger pigeon named Martha, actually had a name, Martha, lived out her life in a cage at the Cincinnati Zoo. She was a captive bred bird. Lived a long life, almost 30 years, but on September the 1st, 1914, she passed away, being the last, the very last of her kind. Following her death, a thorough and detailed necropsy was done by Dr. Robert Schufeld at the National Museum in Washington, D.C. And in his documentation of the necropsy, he wrote what I think is the most uh, touching commentary on the fate of the species. I'll read, I'll read to you what he wrote. Coming to the heart, I, I, I examined with great care all the vessels entering and leaving its several cavities. I did not dissect it, preferring to preserve in its entirety as the heart of the last a passenger pigeon the world will ever see alive. With the final throb of that heart, still another bird became extinct for all time. The last representative of the countless millions and unnumbered generations of its kind. As has been mentioned, Joel Greenberg has written an exceptionally well-researched book about the extinction of the passenger pigeon. It's entitled, A Feathered River Across the Sky of the Passenger Pigeon's Flight to Extinction. It is where I learned that the last verified passenger pigeon in the wild came from Indiana. I had not known that. And of course, so much more that he details about the species and as, it, as the title says, the flight to extinction. Joel will provide us with details of that last verified wild passenger pigeon and its path to extinction. So welcome with me, Joel Green. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I've given lots of talks, but never accompanied by turkey vultures circling <laughs> overhead and uh, chipping sparrows singing. But. Uh, I drove in from Chicago this morning and got here early and, you know, like, no one's here. Oh yeah, it's an hour left. So I, I'm really glad you all braved uh, the possibility of rain uh, to be here. So uh, thanks for all the people 
Mike and others who made this possible. So I just was going to give a, maybe a 10 minute talk on the pigeon and end it with a little more detail about this particular bird. Um, there are some stunning um, quotes about the bird. Uh, Mike quoted Audubon and I'm going to start mine with a quote from Simon Pokagan. Can you all hear me? The last of the great Potawatomi chiefs. And he wrote this. It was proverbial with our father that if the great spirit in his wisdom could have created a more elegant bird in plumage, form, and movement, he never did. When a young man, I've stood for hours admiring the movements of these birds. I've seen them move in one unbroken column for hours across the sky, like some great river ever varying in hue. And as the mighty stream, sweeping on at 60 miles an hour, reached some deep valley, it would pour its living mass headlong down hundreds of feet, sounding as though a whirlwind was abroad. I have stood by the grandest waterfall of America and regarded the descending torrents in wonder and astonishment. Yet never have my astonishment, wonder, and admiration been so stirred as when I witnessed these birds drop from their course like meteors from heaven. I sure hope we don't have torrents uh, before this is over. Um, passenger pigeons were unlike any birds human beings have ever known, and this for three principal reasons. First, they had a huge population, probably in the billions, certainly the most abundant bird in North America and perhaps the world. Second, that population was neither cryptic nor evenly distributed across the landscape. Now, there were times and places where the birds would live in pairs and tens and hundreds, but at times they would form aggregations so large it's difficult to imagine. And um, Mike quoted uh, Audubon, it's darkening the sky for three entire days. And third, it went from billions in 1860s to literally zero when the last individual died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. The depletion of so much abundance in such a short time, at least among vertebrates, is also unique. Passenger pigeons crisscross the landscape in search of food. Here today, gone tomorrow, they were birds of passage, and that's how they received their common name. Their scientific name, Ectopistes migratorius, makes the same point. That, word, that uh, term means wandering migrant. It's kind of redundant, like Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, but it, but it makes, <laughs> makes the point. From their first encounter with the species in 1534, Europeans writing in several languages commented on the abundance of the bird. Such bounty was exploited early, originally to satisfy the demands for food at the family level. The surplus, surplus was often sold in local markets. Then regional markets developed, but this unorganized hunting seemed to have little impact on the bird's population. This changed, however, with the introduction of two new technologies in the 1840s, the railroad and the telegraph. The railroad meant that no matter how remote an area was where the birds were killed, if they could be taken to a local rail station, it was easy to get them to the large urban markets of St. Louis, Chicago, and the big eastern cities. The telegraph meant that wherever the bird showed up, no matter how remote as well, that information could be widely and quickly disseminated. In fact, uh, telegraph operators were specifically told to broadcast um, whenever passenger pigeons were reported in the vicinity. This ability to take ever-increasing quantities led the, to the development of national markets. The country's population grew dramatically during these decades, and the pigeons became a popular food item primarily because they were so cheap. Indeed, they were the cheapest terrestrial protein available. <clears throat> there were times where they were sold for pennies apiece. When a large, breed, large nesting was nearby, the birds would often become worthless to local residents. One report from the large nesting in Michigan in 1878 said the pigeons were used to fill potholes in the road. With this increasing demand, 
there developed a group of hunters that numbered anywhere from 600 to a few thousand who did nothing but chase the birds all year long. When a nesting was reported, say, in Pennsylvania, they would head that way and recruit local help. You say you'd have hundreds of people involved. Trees with nests were cut down, birds were shot and netted by the many thousands, fires were started, and many of the birds would just abandon their nesting efforts in the face of such disturbance. Then, when the birds were finished nesting and, say, headed to Indiana to roost for the fall, as they did at Huntingsburg, the hunters would follow them. So the birds were slaughtered without respite throughout the year, and breeding success plunged to almost nothing. It was not a surprise then that with high mortality and little replacement, pigeon numbers crashed in a matter of decades. It's interesting to note, um, because one might be able to see current um, examples, that um, apolo well, apologists for the passenger pigeon industry tried to allay fears that the birds w were in decline. They claimed that a pair of pigeons laid multiple eggs and nested in nearly in every month of the year save one. I guess they needed one month for vacation. <laughs> but in reality, passenger pigeons only nested once a year and laid a single egg. As the species became even scarcer, some said they shifted locations, now inhabiting the southwestern deserts. One person even claimed that the pigeons all moved to the tropical forests of Colombia, South America, where they changed their plumage so no one would recognize them. <laughs> In the face of inconvenient truths, people have a tendency to deny the facts. Well, in the spring of 1860, a two-day flight of pigeons was carefully described near Toronto, Ontario, that likely had anywhere from 2 to 3.7 billion individuals. And that variation is dependent on how fast you think the birds were flying. The largest nesting on record occurred in central Wisconsin in 1871. It covered 850 square miles and probably involved 136 million adult birds. The last large nesting occurred in uh, Petoskey, Michigan at the upper portion of the Lower Peninsula. 50 million individuals nested across 200 square miles. But just four years later, in 1882, the species nested for the last time in any numbers at all. There were three nestings in Wisconsin and one in Pennsylvania that totaled about a million birds in each. By 1890, there were probably only a few thousand birds left. For a long time, the last wild bird shot was thought to be the individual taken in the spring of 1900 in Ohio named Buttons, and if you're in Columbus, um, she is on display at the Ohio Historical Museum. She was the last immature bird, which is important because that meant at least one pair was able to fledge young in the absence of neighbors. The last passenger pigeon killed in the wild for which there is an extant specimen was an adult male collected near Springfield, Illinois in March of 1901. The beautiful stuffed bird is on display at Milliken University in Decatur. And then there was the pair of passenger pigeons that were observed and heard in Laurel, not far from where we stand. The male was shot. This occurred on April 3, 1902. The bird was purchased by the local druggist, C.K. Muchmore, who stuffed it. Fortunately, the father of Indiana Ornithology, Amos Butler, was told of the record and engaged in correspondence with Muchmore. Muchmore, thankfully, sent Butler the specimen so that the ornithologist could confirm the identification. Unfortunately, he never followed Butler's other suggestion, which was to send it to the State Museum where it could be preserved in perpetuity. Butler made reference to the bird in two notes that he published in the proceeding of the Indiana Academy of Sciences, but nothing of the bird ever appeared in a national journal. 
When I was doing research on my book, I was interested in learning more about the laurel bird, and I reached out to my friend Don Gorney. Don did some sleuthing and learned that Butler's bird records were held by Alan Bruner, archivist of the Indiana Audubon Society. Alan lives near Turkey Run State Park, and on one snowy December day, Don from Indianapolis and I from Chicago converged on Alan's home. The three of us spent several hours going through Butler's <coughs> correspondence until we found two key letters from 1932. We learned that due to illness, much more departed Laurel and left the pigeon and other specimens in the care of a friend. The birds, because of the friend's wife who insisted upon it, were stored in the leaky attic of a woodshed and were ruined by winter rains. The birds were discarded. It's tragic that this remarkable bird is no longer extant, but thanks to Butler, we can harbor no doubts as to the authenticity of the record. Today, we mark that last bird. Thank you very much. There we go. That, how's that work? Don, don't even do that. Here, go ahead. I'm back. There we go. All right, here we go. One, two, three. There we go.